give it a minute. I'll let people get on, see if this has a better signal. It said weak signal in the beginning, but now it doesn't say that. Okay, so we go back out of lunch. Once again, before lunch, I was talking about the vet that's in the wheelchair that they are making get out of the wheelchair and making him walk unassisted through the metal detector upstairs. Um, he, I watched him after lunch going through the metal detector and he, you know, he reached out to hold himself up on the side of it and the guy was kind of yelling at him, like, try to do it, he do it without touching the side. The guy can't make it through. That's why he had a wheelchair. So he struggles. They won't let us assist him walking through. And there's another break. They make us leave the courtroom for the break. After that break, there's different marshals. I add that. Are you, can we assist him walking through? Are you going to make him get out of his wheelchair again? And they said no, because he's been sitting right there. They let him back in. But they need to let us at least assist through so he does not fall on the ground and get hurt there. So I believe that they are targeting us, just like they had this morning, for the size of water that you can bring in now. You can only have 20 ounces. But you can have multiple 20-ounce bottles, but you just can't have your smart water. Which I believe, and later people with smart waters, are walking in. So once again, we go back with FBI Special Agent Sailor. And he is testifying to a bunch of different uh, warrants. They are doing Facebook warrants for uh, uh, Ryan Payne. They're doing Facebook warrants for Ricky Loveland. They're doing a Facebook warrant for Carol Bundy's Facebook page. They're doing a, uh, phone records for Cliven Bundy. They're doing phone records for Eric Parker. They're doing phone records for Ricky Loveland. Um, I think they're doing phone records for Ryan Payne too, or they're just getting Ryan Payne's off of everyone else's. I'm not really sure about that. We went and jumped around so much. So they show all these records, and um, they, they started out the morning with Ricky and his Facebook, and they've been doing that for, for hours and hours and hours, and then they come back and they're doing phone records. And um, then at the end, and, and, and this phone records, okay, so they bring up Todd Ingle too. They have a show a picture of Todd Ingle crouched down with Ricky Loveland behind him. And they bring up Todd Ingle. And um, <clears throat> then they bring up Ricky's phone conversations. And they have six calls from Ricky to Ryan Payne. The first call lasted 37 seconds. The second call lasted 36 seconds. The next call lasted 1 minute 11 seconds. The next call lasted 6 minutes 33 seconds. So that might have actually been a phone call. The next phone call lasted 38 seconds, and the last phone call lasted 7 minutes, 37 seconds. Okay, out of these six calls, of course, they don't say those times in the courtroom. I am writing this down and noticing this off of the paperwork that's up there. That's why I didn't get them for everyone's. But I saw that most of the phone calls they're mentioning here, they are actually um, only seconds long. Um, so, they're bringing all of this in, and... We're kind of like, what you know, they're jumping around a lot and what's going on. Well, they've made it into a timeline. And in their timeline, Rick calls Ryan and then Nick Whiting and then two more people. And the, pay, uh, the phone calls on that um, all show a minute, but they could be less than a minute because they round them up from that. Uh, they got calls from Randy Eaton and James Lardy. Outgoing call to Cheyenne Miller. Um, and then they pull it up all um, with dates, everything that they've been talking about. So both the Facebook posts and the phone calls with dates. They are saying they're linking Ricky to Ryan and saying that he, this is his part of the conspiracy, is that he is going out and um, taking information from Ryan, putting it out on Facebook, and recruiting. So on the 7th, Ryan Payne calls Cliven's home. Uh, then a couple minutes later, he calls Cliven's cell. Of course, on the um, piece of paper, the uh, outline that the federal agent put on there, the times aren't on it. This is a piece of evidence that will go back to the jury and be in the jury room with them, but there's no times on that piece of evidence. But if you look at the other piece of evidence, it's like 37 seconds, 36 seconds. <clears throat> um, then on the 16th, Ryan and Ricky have a phone call. I'm guessing that that might be the 6 minute and 33 second phone call. Then, uh, uh, 20 minutes later, Ricky puts out a call for people to go hit the road and go to the ranch. Um, and then, I want to say the next day or the same day, uh, a few hours later, Ricky likes the MOA page, or o OMA page. Then, um, Payne calls Ricky again. 
<clears throat> and then I lost it. But um, it goes back into Ryan Payne calling Cliven, and then Carol issues a public statement. So they go through all these different Facebooks, and they're and they're making an outline that shows the conspiracy to their to their mind. Um, <clears throat> then they're bringing Cheyenne Miller into it because she's posting things. They're bringing um, websites. So if you've ever been to like if you ever bought something and signed up for a, a <clears throat> web emails from the company. So they're using the OMA email, going out to Cheyenne, and linking Ricky to the conspiracy. How many people don't read those uh, spam emails that you get? There's no proof that he opened it or even saw it. Then they try to enter Ricky Loveland's um, booking photos again. There was an objection to this, and they did a sidebar, and they only showed page four of it, which is just one um, photo of him in shackles, you can only see his lower arm, but you see the tattoo. Next, she has Agent Saylor begins to read Eric Parker's testimony from the previous mistrial. Now, I believe they're reading mostly the uh, cross-examination, not the actual testimony itself. So they're reading questions, yes, no, yes, no, yes, sir, no, sir. That's how I know it's from the uh, cross-examination. So they start out with page 138 and read a line. Then they go to page 146 and read a line. Then they go to page 148 and read a line or two. And then they go to page 149 and read a line. Then 163 and read a line. And then jump back to page 45 in the actual testimony. What they are trying to do here is they are trying to make him um, seem unreliable. Um, I think one of the things they were pointing out is at one point he said he arrived between 1230 and 1. And at another point he's, he arrived at 2. Um, I think that that's, it's close. He arrived in the middle of the night somewhere. Um, there, there was an objection to this from the very beginning. They wanted the rule of completion. They wanted the entire thing played. Of course, the judge is not going to allow that. That would be like Eric Parker testimony, testifying. So they didn't do that. And she just continues on. So then they get partway through and, and mind you, what, part of his testimony are they talking about? Oh, they're talking about the guns that he took. The reason that he took one gun versus the other gun. One of the lines that they read was when he brought his gas mask. Yes, and I brought my gas mask. They read that out of the whole thing. They didn't read anything else. And um, so finally you get to the point where he says, use a force. And there's another objection and a sidebar. My question is, how do you take transcripts from a trial that was a mistrial and have an FBI agent read a defendant's transcripts? How is that justice? How is that truth? Um, <clears throat> during this, the judge is watching the jury and writing things down. Um, I thought that that was very interesting. So then um, they continue to do this for a little bit longer, another sidebar. They're forced to read another portion of Eric's testimony, but we really don't get a fair square here. Um, obviously, they're going to try to prevent him from testifying. Well, I, what I foresee happening here is they're going to try to push this through. They're going to put out the least amount of evidence possible and prevent the defense from putting things up. This trial could be over in two weeks, the way this is going. Um, let's see. Then uh, Perez gets up to cross-examine, and he starts. Um, I believe he's the only one that got through at the, by the end of the day, and I don't even know if he's finished yet. Um, he's bumbling through Facebook like we know about Perez. He doesn't actually have a Facebook. He doesn't know a lot about it. Um, some of the things that I noticed in the beginning is he brought up the email things. He brought up the fact that Ricky isn't actually receiving these MOA emails and that if you're put on this list, anyone could get any of the 300 plus people are getting this email. It's not for a specific person. It's just a mass email being sent out. And he had to kind of work that question with the witness a few times because the witness is trying to skirt around the information as well because this is a witness that has been in the courtroom the entire last trial. That's how come he can testify to Eric Parker's testimony. So everything is convoluted here. I don't see how you can bring up an uh, FBI agent to testify for a defendant who's in the courtroom. That doesn't make any sense to me, but I guess that's exactly how they can bring up an FBI agent like the last trial bring up an FBI agent to attest to the accuracy of evidence, he's pulling off Facebook because we all know nobody edits anything going on to Facebook. 
And, um, you know, what we're seeing here is a circus. It's a facade. It's absolutely ridiculous. Apparently, after I left the courtroom, because I couldn't take it anymore, um, then there was some issue with juror number four. Apparently, one of the U.S. Marshals and um, <clears throat> Tanasi watched this person fall asleep multiple times. Tanasi wrote down the times he saw him sleeping and continued to watch him until he saw he was awake and wrote it down all day long. This juror is one of the jurors that, that they had originally striked and that the judge put back on the jury. So here they let the jury leave for a break and they stay on the record and they discuss these things. It's also being discussed that apparently Stephen Stewart mouthed something towards the jury is what they're saying and they admonished him. They were thinking about putting him in the cell after that. Apparently it's happened twice so he was admonished twice in the courtroom about it. They bring in juror number four. There's a marshal that saw it. Tanasi wrote down dates and times. The government is like no we, they don't want him off at all. Um, and this is the second time it was brought up that he's been dozing off. So here they bring in juror number four. He actually admits that he fell asleep. He said he's, he's used to getting up at two in the morning and working. He's in bed by eight. He, you know, he's, he's working on a plan to get through it. And he said that maybe he fell asleep for maybe only 30, 30 seconds. Tanasi, after he has left the courtroom, Tanasi gets up again and he says, well, I'm going to give you the times again. This is the time I saw him go to sleep, you know, and she allows him to stay on the jury longer. So now, um, I mean, during one of her sidebars, you could see the emotion in her. Um, she was upset that Tanasi was arguing his objection in front of the jury. Upset to the point where she almost like slammed her hands on the desk sidebar and, and goes over to the side. And, you know, what I'm seeing here is I'm hoping that the jury is seeing that this is ridiculous. They had to hear that they were jumping pages in Eric's testimony. Um, they didn't do questions from the jury about from this witness, but they're not done with cross-examination. Um, so what we have here is a show. This is not justice. This is not a courtroom. This is a complete show. And they, if they are allowed to continue with this, these guys will be convicted and go away. Um, I don't see how this is going to continue. I don't know how they can bring in his testimony from the last time, even if he still plans on testifying this time. And, and they all know that because Marchese said that before the trial even began. So I'm kind of at a loss for words. I'm frustrated and I'm hot and I think I'm going to go home now and try to relax. So